For Krima Media's Policy, I'm Sane Jamini. Season Game Simanga discusses her memoir titled Always Another Country. So, Always Another Country is about an itinerant life in exile. Can you tell us why you cried every time when you had to move to another country? I guess as a child, when mm. you have to leave a place where you've just become familiar with people, mm. you're starting to feel stable and mm. settled, mm. and then you have to move. Um, it's always a difficult process. Mm. Um, but I wanted to write a book uh, that was, on the one hand, uh, about those small stories mm. of a small little person, mm. um, because in our country, so many of the stories that we write are about big men, mm. whether it's Nelson Mandela or... <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of stories about big men, and I wanted to write some mm. smaller stories about... Um, women, about mm. children, about our life in exile. How did you feel when you finally came to South Africa, a country that was finally free, as you put it? I mean, it was an amazing feeling to come mm. uh, home mm. uh, because it's not even back since I was born outside. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> so I was coming home to a yeah. place I had never been. Mm. Um, it was beautiful. I mean, that was a very special time in our country's history. Mm. Uh, and it was not just coming home to a place I had always wanted to be. It was coming home in such a good circumstance. Mm. So it was coming home with everything that we had hoped for actually coming true. Mm. Um, so it was a very special time. Your book is also a reminder that home can be anywhere. Is this a theme that you were always trying to illustrate? So I wanted to talk about, initially I thought the book was going to be about uh, the search for home. Mm -hmm. And the more I wrote it, the more it became clear that it was really a book about belonging. Mm -hmm. And home is a metaphor for mm -hmm. belonging. But the thing that we really want is to belong uh, to one another. And in my instance, I wanted to feel as though I belonged to this country. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the book takes you full circle in that journey of yeah. trying to understand that. Describe your understanding of the intersection between personal and political. So I think for m most of us who grew up in South Africa uh, or who grew up outside South Africa but influenced by South Africa, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the personal was very political mm -hmm. because whether you were black or white or Indian or colored, that personal identity mm -hmm. was made political by the mm -hmm. system. Um, so in many ways, that's what my book is about, mm. uh, is about the fact that even the things that we think are personal to ourselves uh, are profoundly political. And my mm. own family's personal journey mm. then becomes a journey of, in some ways, the politics of the country. Mm. Sisonge, tell us a little bit about your mom and your memories of her. Oh, she was an amazing woman. Mm. So when I started the book, uh, because I was interested in exploring the idea of home and then mm -hmm. ultimately the idea of belonging, mm -hmm. it hadn't occurred to me that the book would in fact in some ways be a love letter to my mother. Mm -hmm. And so in, in the end, that's mm -hmm. very much what it, mm -hmm. what it became, mm -hmm. a very, very remarkable woman. I liked how your mom stood her ground on how she would raise you despite living in Canada. You wanted a bike, but you had to save for it. Tell us about that aspect. So my mother, um, one of the most important things to her about mm. uh, that she wanted to instill in her children was independence. Mm. Maybe because all three of us are girls, mm. so she thought it was important that we be able to stand on our two feet. And uh, it was in, in, independence was important at many levels, but especially when it came to money. Mm. So she wanted us to make sure that if you want something, you have to plan for it. Mm. You have to be able to afford it yourself. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very early lesson because all the other kids in Canada, mm -hmm. their parents were buying them things. Exactly. Also, I think um, we did, probably didn't have the money to buy mm -hmm. for her to just be buying yeah, us things. Yeah. So it was another, also a, a nice way of teaching us, mm -hmm. but also probably due to the financial circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> So you dedicated a chapter to your granny, Lindy Wemabuza. It looks like you had a special bond when she came to Lusaga. Briefly tell us about her. Yes, so Coco Lindy was uh, 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 a freedom fighter. She was very active in the African National Congress um, in the 1970s, 80s, all the way to the 90s. She mm. became uh, an ambassador to Germany, mm. uh, to the UK. Mm. She was all over. Um, a very powerful woman, mm -hmm. very um, 
in the family, she was someone who was always difficult. She didn't <laughs> um, care about people liking her. Uh, she cared about doing things the right way, mm -hmm. properly, uh, which made her unpopular with some people, <laughs> although much loved and respected. Mm -hmm. uh, but she and I always had a very special bond. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, 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 I write about her as, mm. as a sort of one of the, the early influences mm. in my life. Can you also tell us a bit about any of the struggle icons that you can remember? Um, sure. I mean, in some ways in the book, I specifically don't name names. Mm -hmm. And part of why I don't name names mm. is because in post-apartheid South Africa, a lot of people have let us down. So <laughs> I thought it was better to leave the certain mm -hmm. things unsaid mm -hmm. and to describe the environment yeah, rather yeah, than yeah. to name mm -hmm. the people. Because as soon as you print their names and then they let you down or mm -hmm. people say, oh, hmm, maybe they, she's also like this one. Exactly. <laughs> Racism is still very much prevalent in our country. And you also experienced it in Canada when a boy called you an African monkey. Tell us about that incident and how your father reacted to it. So, I mean, for us, when we moved to Canada, it was mm -hmm. our first time really experiencing, not experiencing racism, because obviously there's mm -hmm. racism everywhere, mm -hmm. but it was my first time to be so much in the minority. Mm -hmm. uh, there were just so few black people around us. And the feeling of being treated in a racist way when you are such a minority mm -hmm. is very different. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, and so I was on the playground, this uh, uh, child bullies me, calls me a monkey, I go home, I tell mm. my parents what happened, and the next day my father insisted on taking me to school to mm. talk to the principal about it and to insist on an apology. Um, and part of why it was such a formational, foundational um, lesson for me mm. was because it taught me at a very young age that if somebody abuses you racially, that is their problem mm. and they must be held accountable mm -hmm. because for many of us I think growing up when someone humiliates you racially you feel the shame mm -hmm. as though you've done something exactly. and so what he was teaching me was that the person who should feel bad is the person who did it mm -hmm. not the person who's experiencing mm -hmm. it. In other parts of the book you sound disappointed about how things have turned out in South Africa like the AIDS crisis and racism. Is that a fair judgment? I think so. Mm. I, think, I think most South Africans would probably agree with the fact that, um, that the, there's been a lot of disappointments that this mm. government has, has brought us. Mm. I think the epic rates of corruption, mm. uh, the real misjudgments on HIV, mm. the failing education system, mm. Uh, there are lots of things yeah. uh, um, that I think have gone wrong. Would we exchange freedom for that? Of course not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think part of the problem is that often when people criticize, it's as though we're saying it was better before. Mm -hmm. I think it's possible to say, of course it's much better now, mm -hmm. but it ought to be even better than what yeah. it is. And lastly, South Africa is trying to pick up its pieces with President Ramaphosa at the helm. What does this mean for you? Nothing in particular, to be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, think, um, I think one of the most important lessons, and I talk about this in my book, mm -hmm. is to be very careful around making out people to be heroes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very good that we do not have the president that we had. Mm -hmm. uh, those nine years were terrible for the country, mm -hmm. just ob objectively speaking, mm -hmm. regardless of what you think about President Zuma on any mm -hmm. personal basis, mm -hmm. uh, his leadership was very bad for our country. Mm -hmm. um, it is also the case that for um, four of those nine years, President Ramaphosa was his deputy mm -hmm. president. And so it's really important mm -hmm. to recognize that the African National Congress and the state that it was in that enabled President Zuma to really bring down our country, mm -hmm. that party remains in power. And those people remain in senior positions who are always there. So there isn't much that's new. Mm. So I think the ceremony was new, but nothing else has changed. Mm. So it's early days. I think people always want to feel hopeful. Mm. I, 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 I don't think that it's useful to have empty hope. And I think the idea of the new dawn is a branding project mm. and it gives us empty hope. 
I do think it's important to look at what's possible. So what are the possibilities? Mm. And certainly it is now more possible for South Africa to recover than it was under President Zuma. Mm. So if that's where we find hope, that's fine. Mm. But I'm watching to see. That was Sisonke speaking to Prima Media's policy about her book titled Always Another Country.